Okay. Right, we live. Okay. Um, uh, hi, um, I'm Gavin Giovanoni. I'm Professor of Neurology at Barts in the London, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Dobson, who is a senior lecturer working at the Wilson Institute, and she's the principal investigator on our Barts MS uh, corona, coronavirus antibody study. Um, we have Professor David Baker, who's a immunologist and the mouse doctor. Then we have Angre Kang, who is the discoverer and inventor of our super sensitive assay called the glow body assay and we uh, hope that you will find this discussion uh, interesting and will support us in, in raising money to um, perform a, a both a cross-sectional and a longitudinal study in people with multiple sclerosis so let's start with the mouse doctor david can you just give us um, some background why it's important to study antibody responses to the coronavirus um, okay so Antibody responses are obviously part of our immune response, and that uh, is important because um, that will tell us how we're going to actually deal and handle the infection if, if it occurs. So uh, in terms of the immune response to the virus, we have the a T cell response, the macrophage response, and the antibody response. And what we believe is that the antibody response, if it's, if it's strong, it will stop people getting infected. Uh, and also it will be there to prevent you getting reinfected because obviously the coronavirus isn't going to go away. And we do know that people will encounter the, the virus more than once. And therefore it's important to, you know, develop a, an immune response. So that protects you from obviously the, the, the problems of COVID. But likewise, what we also know is that many people with COVID actually don't uh, show symptoms and probably that's partly because of antibody responses to past infections to the cold causing coronaviruses. So with having assays that can perhaps pick these different elements up, we can kind of understand uh, what your protection is and also potentially uh, what your risks are and maybe also how you respond to vaccines and how the different disease modifying drugs may uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, impinge on that. So Ruth, can you just um, briefly summarize what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do with the study? Yeah, so I think there's so many things that we don't know about how um, disease modifying therapies impact on the immune responses to the coronavirus, as, as David said. And I think what we're aiming to do with this study first off is just actually establish how many people with MS across a large population have immune responses to the coronavirus. And then actually look at how these change over time as well. So from the beginning, we need to relate this to the exposures that people have had, what they've been doing around shielding, what they've been doing um, around their disease modifying therapy. And then actually as things evolve over time, look at whether people on different disease modifying therapies get a prolonged immune response to the coronavirus, whether this is impacted again by disease modifying therapy and how many people seroconvert over time. So actually how many people are generating immune responses to the virus over the upcoming months and potentially even years. Um, and this really helps us to understand how these therapies impact on immune responses and, and gives us information not only about the coronavirus, but as David said, also about vaccines, about other forms of, of immunity to all kinds of um, diseases. So I'm a patient, someone with MS, okay. Um, how, am I, um, how am I going to be contacted and what, I, what do I actually have to do to participate in the study? So in the initial phase of the study, what we're going to do is we're going to concentrate on our Bart's MS population. We know we've got a large population. They're all, um, the majority of people are based around London. So people actually can, um, we know that these people will have had potentially the highest exposure to the virus and give us the most useful information at the beginning of the study. Depending on the results and depending on the funding that we have, we may be able to open this up to people actually contacting us to, to take part in the study. And that may be a later part, but at the moment, really, we're going to focus on the patients whom, whom we know and who we have a lot of the clinical information available about. Okay. And Greg, tell us about, because this is all um, premised on your uh, fantastic invention, the glow body antibody assay. Can you tell us what the glow body antibody assay actually is? The, the glow body assay is basically taking your antigen that you're interested in, and this could be the SARS-CoV uh, main antigen, the nuclear capsid, or maybe the spike, and we tag it with an enzyme uh, which generates light. And so if you have antibodies that bind to this, 
you can separate those away and determine how much light is being emitted. And the amount of light being emitted is directly proportional to the amount of antibodies you have in, in your serum sample. And the nice thing about the assay is, is it's very, very sensitive. And we don't really need that much material in order to do the assays, a, a fraction of what the other assays are using, basically. And so is there enough um, antibody in those little blood spots that come on those cut three cards to do it? No, there will be more than, currently when we look at plasma or serum samples, we're assaying two and a half microliters. And okay. a three card blood spot, it's about 60 microliters of blood. So we'll be able to get the antibody out of that and assay that comfortably. Yeah, so I think for most people, they, they can't perceive how little a microliter is. A microliter is one thousandth uh, of a milliliter. So it's a really tiny, tiny, tiny amount. Um, and a milliliter is a thousandth of a liter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. That, and that's like two pints. Well, well <laughs> what we say is it's just a very small spot of blood uh, is, is, is enough for us to do the studies that we want to do. I mean, I mean, there's a potential for this to go way beyond what we're trying to do in MS. So surely this could be just used in the general population, you know, to screen people sending in blood spots from all over the place? Well, one of the areas we, we were thinking about using this technology is uh, ADA testing, anti-drug antibodies. Uh, where you have patients on, say, alentuzumab or ocrelizumab, rather than having them come into the clinic, we can send out the cards, they send the cards back, and we can run the assays off those spots as well. Okay. That's the Ruth, maybe, maybe you just want to put this in context. The reason why we're going with the CARS is because you've done another study with the CARS, you know, uh, the vitamin D study. So this is not a new technology. We're not testing something that hasn't been tested before. That's right. I think there's, you know, there's, there's well set up precedent for using blood spots. And the, the kind of blood spots we talk about are the same kind of blood spots that are taken from newborn babies in the first week of their life. So it's literally a prick, a, a finger prick, and a drop of blood onto, onto a piece of absorbent paper. Yeah. Um, and we know, and we've got results that show that we can test vitamin D very well in these samples. We can extract and test vitamin D, and also from from other scientific literature, we know that actually antibodies are very suitable to be tested in these blood spots. They're very stable. And they're stable um, certainly in other diseases in the blood spots for up to ten years. So this is not something that sort of goes off in the post that needs to get to the lab within hours. Actually, it's a really efficient way of collecting blood um, that people can send in. From our vitamin D study, we also know that actually, when we get the cards back, almost all of them have usable blood spots. They're actually very user friendly and people can, people can do it at home with really minimal assistance. Oh, that's very good. Mm -hmm. So people always ask you the question is, why are we crowdfunding? Why don't we just get our money via traditional routes? And I think um, the reason why we crowdfunding this particular project is because we are working on a, against a, t a ticking a ticking clock. It's only current now. And if we wait six, 12 months, it will be irrelevant. So we have to do the study now. Our university has stopped us using other sources of money to fund research because that money has to be kept for... Uh, contingency spending plans around the uh, sh uh, shortfall induced by the COVID pandemic. So we can't use other internal pots of money. And when you go by the traditional funding route, there's, uh, there's a funding cycle that takes six to 12 months by writing a grant, putting it in, getting it peer reviewed. So that just doesn't work for the, the, the timeline. So this is uh, why we are, we are crowdfunding this. So um, I, I don't want people to criticize. This is not the route we would normally uh, go to fund these types of research projects. But unless we get this project started uh, and at least the first phase completed, um, the results really aren't going to be that relevant to the to the community. You know, once a vaccine comes out and everybody's vaccinated, we have to get the results out, get the results mm -hmm. in in the next two to three months. Any other comments from you? Any, well, any? I mean, the other thing is, of course, if, if a vaccine is coming along, wouldn't it be great to know almost... Um, that you've made a vaccine response. And, you know, again, we know with some of the MS drugs that may uh, affect it. And again, by having those baseline samples, it kind of tell, can tell you what is happening over time. Um, and as Angre said, you know, in the long run, the future is in different aspects. It, it's a technology we're developing uh, and it can be used in, in additional ways. Not, it's not just COVID. No. And, 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 you know, the, the probably the, the end result will be actually far reaching in some 
other aspect of multiple sclerosis research or research in, in, in other conditions. But um, so, well, I mean, I mean, that, people don't realize we are uh, the, the actual platform, the infrastructure may lead to other projects. So just one example, everybody knows that neurofilament levels, which is the marker um, that we measure to measure breakdown of the brain and the spinal cord, and that gets released into the blood and we can, uh, we have a, we have an assay um, uh, that can pick that up on a type of a blood spot. It's called the plasma mm -hmm. spot. But I mean, I can see us in the future using this for a lot of other biomarkers mm -hmm. to study MS. All right, thank you very much. Let's hope we raise the money and uh, um, keep working. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.